Incarceration hurts at a place that's hard to touch, at a place that's difficult to reach. Those are not my words, but those of Susan Burton. Susan, a mom, lost her five-year-old son due to an accident in front of their home. A truck hit him. That led to a spiraling depression for her. And that would be understandable for any mother, father, grandparents, or siblings. It resulted in Susan self-medicating, first with cocaine and then with crack. At no point in her journey was she provided any kind of psychological counseling, any kind of response to her grief through medicine, through psychology, none of that. But instead, she found herself in and out of prison for possession, not because she was selling drugs, but because she was self-medicating, trying to find a way to deal with her pain. Her situation's not unusual. Two-thirds of the women who happen to be incarcerated in the United States are nonviolent offenders. The overwhelming majority of these women are in jail due to drug-related crimes. It brings to mind a poem for me written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar that is often attributed to Maya Angelou. And a little bit of it goes like this. I know why the caged bird beats his wing until his blood is red on the cruel bars because he must fly back to his perch and cling when fain he would be on a bow a swing, and a pain still throbs in those old, old scars, and it pulses with a keener sting. I know why the caged bird, and we can use this, beats her wing. The United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. In fact, you could say we incarcerate off the map, off the chart. Much of what we know about mass incarceration is dominated by this view. We think of it in the context of men. Women and girls happen to be invisible. They are the collateral damage of our failed drug war, our war on crime. And even when the most compelling advocates for criminal justice reform exercise their voices in recent years, to elevate the discourse on mass incarceration, and I'm talking about former Attorney General Eric Holder and then President Obama. When both made compelling speeches about mass incarceration, Attorney General Eric Holder before the American Bar Association, and then a couple years later, President Obama before the NAACP, both spoke in such heartfelt ways about the mistakes that we've made in mass incarceration the racial implications, the high costs. But in both speeches, they referenced only men. They forgot about women. But if you look here, you will see that we need to be equally concerned about women and in mass incarceration. In his lifetime, an African-American male stands a chance of one in three of possible incarceration, criminal punishment. For African-American women, it's one in 18. Now let that sit with us. And even more compelling, the United States incarcerates more women than any other country in the world, more than Russia, more than China, India, Thailand, Mexico combined. The US has only 5% of the world's population, but incarcerates 25%, right? 25% of those who happen to be incarcerated globally are here in the United States. Now, what is it that we need to do about this? Well, part of this is that we need to recognize what this is and why it's happened and the impacts. 
My colleague, Kristen Turney, who teaches at UCI in the sociology department, reminds us, she informs us, that for children of an incarcerated parent, they fare worse than a child who's experienced a parent's death. They fare worse psychologically, and they fare worse physically. This has become such a problem that even Sesame Street has tried to address it. They have a Muppet now named Alex, and Alex is a Muppet that has a parent incarcerated. And why has Sesame Street done this? Because they realize the collateral consequences of the way in which we've incarcerated in the United States. Of the more than 67 million people who have some form of a record, a criminal record in the United States, they face about 45,000 collateral consequences, making it very difficult for re-entry. But we make it very difficult for their children. Now this story has the impacts that directly tie into women's lives. In the 1980s, as we were launching our war on drugs, there was specific attention targeted at black women and at Latina women. And it was this narrative of the crack mom, and that this crack mom would produce children who would ravage society. They would be the worst students in our schools. In fact, schools would not be able to educate them. It was said that they would have brains that were born too small, that they would have organs that wouldn't function correctly, that they would have abnormal genitalia. This was the narrative. But what Dr. Hallam Hurt at the University of Pennsylvania knew and Dr. Claire Coles at Emory knew because they had been doing longitudinal studies in these areas, and not just on cocaine and crack, but also alcohol, tobacco, et cetera, was that we were demonizing whole classes of women, and the data that was being reported was not accurate. The New York Times came to this understanding a few years ago and online has a video now where they revisit the crack mom epidemic that wasn't, as they say. But many lives were hurt along the way. Between 1977 and 2007, the rate of incarceration for women rose over 800% in the United States. Now, a part of this was also the way in which economically we looked at poor women, women like Susan Burton, women who did not have health insurance. These women were considered the dregs of society. At the same time that the narrative about the crack mom was all on the news, so was a narrative about the welfare queen. That is, these women who somehow wrecked our economy, that they were responsible for our economic woes, and in fact they weren't, but they were very convenient scapegoats. So much so that the scapegoating and stereotyping suggested that they would be the worst mothers ever. And this kind of narrative continued with billboards placed around the country. And here, one even recently, right? The notion that the worst place in the world for a black child happens to be in her mother's womb. And this rate of incarceration is not just in state-run prisons or federal, but also privately run prisons. And it's worth noting, too, as Susan Burton has done in a book that she's written, about how it feels like being a slave, being incarcerated in the United States. What many people don't realize is how much work is done behind prison bars and such little pay. In California, our wildfires are often put out by women who happen to be incarcerated with very limited training and very paltry wages. But this is a problem that we need to pay attention to across the country. And we've incarcerated so much that we can no longer afford to put more people in jail because our prisons are overcrowded, leading to horrific conditions within. Susan Burton, whom I've referenced, this is a, the cover of her book. And I want to take us through this narrative. In the last 40 years, we've spent $1.5 trillion 
on our failed drug war. We've spent $450 billion jailing drug offenders, $215 billion in an overburdened judiciary, and then we have tens of millions of dollars in other costs. And here's the grand result. Have we won? Have we resolved our drug war? Have we provided the treatments for people that we need? Or have we failed? And I think many realize now that, in fact, we have failed. But there are so many lives that have been impacted by this. It's a public health crisis now, mass incarceration. Medical neglect that occurs behind bars is absolutely stunning. You see in this image a person named Sue Ellen Allen, and she started an organization called Genus Team. Now, Sue Ellen was a debutante in Texas. She grew up in a very wealthy family. By the time she was three, she had traveled to Venezuela. By the time she was five, she was at the Louvre. She had been in Paris and Rome, all around the world. But she ended up incarcerated. Before she was incarcerated, though, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And for a good reason for her life that she was diagnosed before going in, because once she was in prison, she realized the care that she would not receive. As she describes in her memoir, she was taken to get, as she described it, her breast chopped off in shackles in chains, and she was shackled during the process. She was left in a holding cell with roaches and rats while waiting for this surgery. She founded this organization called Gina's Team, and you might think, well, she would have started it called Sue Wellen's Team, but she didn't. Gina was her 25-year-old cellmate. And when Gina was complaining of having these incredibly painful headaches, and that when she chewed, it felt like she was chewing on ice, Sue Ellen begged that a thermometer could be given to her because she said it had such a high fever, but none came. Other women begged for the same. They were threatened with solitary confinement. Now, they were incarcerated in Arizona, and in Arizona, there's a special kind of way of punishing someone with solitary confinement. It can be putting them out in the yard where the temperatures are over 100 degrees. There are women who have literally fried in the middle of the fields. By the time a thermometer was given to Gina, she lapsed into a coma, and she died three days later. That's why the organization is called Gina's Team. I was giving a talk just a couple years ago, and I got a call from Sue Ellen in the middle of the night, and she said, I'm so sorry, Michelle, to be calling you at 2 in the morning, but I just didn't know what to do. And I said, Sue Ellen, what's wrong? And she said, Michelle, Gina's oldest daughter just shot herself in the head tonight. These are the collateral consequences that I'm talking about. It used to be a time in which having a child behind bars, bringing the child into jail, was seen as a punishment. But now we incarcerate so many women that it is now a reward, an award for good behavior that their children get to grow up in prison behind bars. The costs of this are extreme. It costs more in New Jersey to incarcerate a person than it does to send them to Princeton. We know that rehabilitation works, but we also know that prison doesn't. And what does this mean for African-American children? They are nine times more likely than their white counterparts to have a parent in jail. And think about the psychological tolls in that regard. Life behind bars comes with enormous collateral consequences. And those consequences impact children's lives. And I want to turn to that before I close with you today. 
For parents who go behind bars who are incarcerated, their children often end up in foster care. And many people think of foster care as a place in which children may very likely get adopted, but we know, in fact, they don't. And many of them do not actually live in foster homes. A number of children, thousands in the United States, who have parents that are incarcerated live in group homes or they live in shelters. And for those who end up aging out of foster care, which is the overwhelming majority of the kids who end up in foster care, of the young men, 80% will have been arrested, 60% convicted. For girls, so many, 75% age out pregnant, a quarter of them who will be homeless. And if you want to think about whether any of this has been successful in the lives of those children, realize that only 6% of those who age out of foster care have a two or a four year degree. When Susan Burton says that incarceration hurts at a place that is difficult to touch, a place that is difficult to reach. This is what she's talking about. And let's think about this. If you had a cell phone that failed 40% of the times in which you turned it on, or a laptop that failed 40% of the time that you turned it on, or a very expensive car that wouldn't start, at least four out of the 10 times in which you turn on. And this is a conservative statistic, right? The rate of recidivism is somewhere between 40 to 60%. But if it failed that often, those things that you use, you would say it's broken, right? We need to fix it. And that's true of mass incarceration. It's a broken system. And it's a system that's well worth our energy to fix. Thank you so much.